Hannah. Hi. Hi. I started my business at a very young age, and I know you did too, but you've started a business in an industry that historically has big traditional players. Why did you choose your business and what gave you the confidence to do so? Um, you know what's interesting? I think I actually said this the other day that if I was to look back, I would probably say I probably needed a bit more experience before I started my business because I feel like I've learned harsher lessons. So obviously in the talent management world, it's like, I think because I was young, I almost had more confidence than I do now. So I was 24 when I started my business and I had two talents and I don't know why, I just think at the time I thought I knew everything. Like I'd worked for another management a magazine. I knew all the like, a lot of women from the same industry, you know, like reality TV influencers and Maybe it was my naivety at the time, but I was like, yeah, like I know everything. And then the deeper I got, I was like, wow, no, absolutely nothing about anything I'm doing. And then I feel like it kind of got to the point where I was like, mm, I'm just gonna blag my way until I get to where I need to be. But I chose the industry that I'm in because I feel like I wanted to make a difference to, when I worked at 66 Magazine, I met a lot of young women and I could see different ways that maybe people could push them in their personal lives or you know in, in if they had different managements outside and I wanted to be the change and make sure that they were looked after and made sure that actually there was a safe space and I also really saw that gap in the market there's not really as many managements doing this like the sisterhood and creating a family and creating a production within and creating this 360 degrees so I guess it was kind of a bit of both as to why I started but and the, obviously the women thing is so important to you. Like your business is female only talent management, like crazy disrupting the whole industry basically. How, what? Why is that so important to you? I don't think I know what to do with a man really. Like, where, like why put them in the corner? Like, do you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't know how to manage a man, but you know, everything I'm about is female empowerment. I have, where I think, you know, so I dropped out of university, I started working in industries that were predominantly male, I did notice almost if I got put in a senior position or if I was put in a place where I could make calls, there would be an issue. Like if I had asked that question, it would be like, well, I don't explain myself to you. Mm. And I was like, why, why does it matter if I'm the one asking or, you know, Tom from down the road? I made this name up, by the way. I've never worked with someone called Tom. Um, <laughs> but... Just disclaimer for Hannah Disclaimer <laughs> for anyone who might think I've worked with someone called Tom. But you know, that was kind of the position I was put in. So when it came to my own business, I, everything that I disliked about working for someone else's company or previous companies, I wanted to put instill into mine. So it's, my grandma always taught me, you should, you know, you learn what not to do from your parents. And I feel it's the same with your work. You learn how you wouldn't want to run your business. And then there's bits and pieces that you take that you love as well. So I'm like an in-betweener. I think that's so, so true. I've applied so much of what I didn't like about the businesses that I worked for before and tried to change them in my business. And the, from the culture front, it's so important to me that people love what they do because I think when people love what they do, they do their best work. But to go back to what you were saying a minute ago about working in an industry that's predominantly male and like you seeing stuff that you didn't, you didn't really like, I can so relate to that as someone who... I do a lot of content, you know, on LinkedIn. And one of the things yeah, that I think- Yeah, you're good on LinkedIn. I, you actually taught me about LinkedIn <laughs> at a barbecue. At a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> a friend's barbecue, we turned into a business conversation and no one came near us, shockingly enough. I know, we're the only two people there like running and scaling businesses who are just like <laughs> magnetically pulled together. Um, but one of the things that I found as a woman in business, which is a predominant, there's a lot of women running marketing agencies, but there's very few women running marketing agencies at scalability, right? So competing with the bigger dogs and, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of that is without kind of picking any names, kind of middle-class white men. I've found that putting out content as a woman that is challenger, that is calling out bullshit, that is probably a little bit um, not predictable from what they mm. think that I should be. I don't fit in the box that everyone wants me to be in. I get a lot of hate for it, particularly on LinkedIn. I get a lot of predominantly men that are not happy 
that a woman has that kind of opinion. I know it's to do with gender because I've got many, many colleagues who work in an, a similar space. They have way more opinions than me, but they don't get the same response. So how have you managed that as a female running a business that's predominantly male owned, right? There's a couple of yeah. players in your space that are women running businesses, but how do you operate? How do you deal with those instances where you may have felt like gender had a part to play? Is what what you're talking about in terms of since I started my business? In in any area of your career, I how think, have you handled that? I think, you know, since I started my business, I only really saw it at the beginning. And I do believe it's how you allow that to affect you is how that kind of transpires. So for me, I don't look at myself as a female entrepreneur. I'm just an entrepreneur. And if my gender is something that causes issues or people think like, you know, a certain way, then that's their issue. And I think at the beginning, I was really sensitive to it. And I would hear things being said and I'd be like, oh, but I still get it now. Like p men owned companies have stolen bits and ideas of I've done, or, you know, I've recently seen some of my branding, looks like it's been ch like, you know, moved. And I think though, I like, I like this quote and it sounds a little bit, you know, cringy, but Coco Chanel said, if you want to be authentic, you have to be prepared to be copied. And I think it just makes myself feel better. It means that I'm disrupting an industry and it means that these men are actually intimidated by me because otherwise there was no reason to behave a certain way or mm. I've never cared about anyone's gender. And if anything, I would actually say my age is the biggest thing that I see um, in terms of like people ask to speak to my boss <laughs> or like how I go, oh, how long have you worked with the company? Well, I guess from the beginning, but I don't know. You know, like... But I think you have to, to own your own business, you have to have a strong personality anyway. And my deflection is like, I just make a joke of it, but I know it can affect other people. But you know, for me, I, I don't really care what, you know, what a man has to say about me. I've never cared, you know, what a man has to say about me. I would probably be a different woman if I did. So, you know, being outspoken woman is actually one of the most powerful things you can be. Let a man hate because they can never be you. That's what I think. Love and that. they're jealous they're not young anymore, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you said a minute ago that you dropped out of university. Why? Mm. <laughs> um, be careful what I said. I had an argument with my placement. Essentially, I was the first person in 25 years to be sacked from my placement on my course. I'm not going to divulge why, because I very much disagree with the decision. But if at the time, I remember I literally was crying in the middle of Manchester on the phone to my dad, like, <gasps> dad, I do you know, and my dad always taught me, you know, a situation doesn't really define you. It's how you handle it. That's what defines you. And, you know, what felt like the end of my world actually was the beginning because I literally became like the hardest working person. I know like I was on Instagram every day trying to find a job worked at 66 and then you know I had I started my company whilst at 66 and did six months I was Demi, uh, I was Harley Brash's manager for six months when she came straight off the villa whilst working a full-time job and I'd have to run to the toilet and I remember my boss was like do you have like a bladder problem I was like yeah I do you know I you know if you want it hard enough you'll work every hour under the sun and I think you couldn't own a business unless you're willing to sacrifice parts of your life in order to get there I think that's so true uh, what one of the things that I find, I struggle with this concept of hustle culture because I understand why people are potentially th feel bad about it or feel negative towards it or, or are worried about their mental health and the implications mm. that overworking potentially has on it. However, I feel like we're living in a generation right now that is worried about hard work. That it's like It's almost like we've glamorized not working no, hard. So you're so right. Sorry to interrupt. I do that a lot. Um, but... I actually said this to someone the other day that if I'm not posting that I'm going to a meeting, I feel like I'm not working hard. Mm. It's like we're in an Instagram bubble where you have to almost prove that you're busy in order for people to feel like they're validated. And it's actually very, it winds me up because actually I've got no time to take pictures. Like yesterday I did like my quarterly budget, but you know, I'm not gonna put that on Instagram. You know, you don't put on Instagram when you're crying because you're like, God, this is just so intense. And I've spoken to so many different, well, mostly women in business because that's, you know, who I relate to. But, you know, I feel like we've all kind of gone through the same sort of emotional mixes. But social media, you don't want to show people that side of you where, you know, you don't feel strong and you feel like you are out of your depth. And 
it's because of I do think hustle culture is a massive part of that it's influencers who have businesses and say making that is really easy and it's you know it's not when you're building something from the ground up and you're just trying to you know you're trying to disrupt industry you're scaling you're looking at your finances you know we grew so quickly in two years that I didn't actually have enough staff or by the time mm. you know it got to that point and I was going into panic mode and as a result, I actually ended up hiring like someone who didn't fit that role and that became actually a, a costly lesson. And, you know, I take everything very personally, which I do think is one of my biggest downfalls and biggest benefits. But as a result, I lost money. So it's almost, you have to almost plan as if you're gonna be humongous because I didn't think that to my own, like, I guess, downfall, you know, I ended up, going down this weird route of like chaos. Mm. I've actually moved offices twice and that is also chaotic. Don't recommend, stick to your lease. <laughs> you said something interesting a minute ago about um, you, you, if, you, if you're not posting on social media, you're not actually busy. Yeah. Grace mm -hmm. Beverly spoke recently. I was listening to her podcast with Stephen Bartlett, The Diary of a CEO. Do you know, I've, watched, I've listened to half of it. I don't know if I've got to that part yet. She, she is a very interesting person and a grace if you're listening i want to have you on this podcast very articulate i she, love her she was speaking about this idea of acceptance culture or sorry idea of announcement culture that unless it's announceable then it's mm. like you haven't done it so us all squirreling away you know trying to make as much money as we possibly can so we can hire those next five people or we can scale that business mm. and charge more and do a better job and get more bookings for our clients or you know all the things that we're all trying to do in our businesses that's all not announceable because it's not sexy it's not interesting it's not things that people go oh wow they're doing well it's the stuff that it's the stuff that we don't want to share that actually grows our businesses and I think it was a really important point that she was making in that if it doesn't get announced, did it really happen? And people look at the likes of Grace, they look at the likes of Stephen Bartlett, they look at the likes of you, maybe even me and think, wow, they did that quick. And it's like, you, we didn't. We've been working probably 10, 12 years up until that point. And now all of a sudden you're seeing everything because we can show you it now. I actually forget to tell people I've hired someone new. I'm like, oh God, this is their email. So in, especially in my industry, we have like a directory called Diary Directory. It has every brand under the sun that you can think mm. of. Um, and it's like a great tool. So if you're trying to get into management, I highly recommend it's the best subscription you'll get. It was one of the first actual, well, it felt like a big spend at the time, but you know, in the grand scheme, no, but it's how I met my contacts. And everyone, like the moment they hire a new member of staff, the moment they announce uh, talent, anything goes straight on there. And my PR manager was like, you are so behind. And I was like, oh really, What? why? And she was like, you've got eight members of staff and it says you've got three. And I was like, Ooh, who have I hired? <laughs> like, I think, you know, the most, I actually learned this from my last job, it's the boring things that make a business run. The fun things are never the, it's always the cost effect, like they're not cost effective, but they're important for your business. But spreadsheeting, which is something I really try to avoid for a long time, is the most important thing. Knowing your figures, knowing everything is the thing that I almost uh, had to teach myself to love, but, it's taken me a, a while. I don't think I'm like the stereotypical entrepreneur. I'm not really calculating in a way that I can go step ahead. I have big ideas and then I sit and try and scale them in a way backwards. And then I look at my budgets, whereas other people might go budget, then go idea. I th so I was saying actually to my office manager, who's with me, shout out to Evie. Woo. She, I was saying like, I'm not the stereotypical entrepreneur. And I always feel like when I do podcasts, I'm not, a great example in a way because I feel other people are maybe more put together I don't know maybe that's my own sort of issues but I do feel like maybe it's imposter syndrome I don't even know but I always feel that there's someone who does something better but we've come across better because of my skill set and my team I think I'm rambling I'm not really sure at this point <laughs> it's, it's interesting what you're saying though about like playing to your skills because I am I'm like you I have all the ideas and 90% of them are shit like and, and that's okay like I think part of being an entrepreneur 90 is 90% being... of mine are very undoable to be honest <laughs> like my, but, my team are like Hannah stop I'm like but I think it's one of those things in entrepreneurship that you are just generally, whether you're, as you say, strategic or not, I would say I'm strategic, but in a creative way. Like I have no interest in zero. I have no interest in numbers. I have no, it sounds terrible saying that, but I hire people to do that for me so I can focus on the big pitch and macro stuff. Um, but I do think this kind of entrepreneurship as a concept is a bit of a disease that 
It's you just get. become popular now. It's like but cool you, to have a business. <laughs> correct, correct. But it's, I think there's a big difference between having a business and being an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurship for me takes over your entire life. I don't have a minute where I'm not thinking about it, doing it in a meeting, answering an email. I live, breathe, die, blood, sweat, tears, my business. And I think that's something that you're born with. What do you think? I have a pretty um, addictive personality, I would say. So I, I do I do get quite obsessed. You know, I'll be sat in bed, it'll be 2 a.m. and I'll be on my phone still going through emails and I feel like I've missed something or I start texting my team like, well, was this done? And it's like, come on, Hannah, it's 2 a.m. Um, but luckily for me, I have, I have a great friendship with my team, so I'm actually not that boss. I don't expect them to reply, by the way. But I do think you have to be obsessed. If you're not obsessed with your business, it's never going to go anywhere. I think if you're going to, if you actually want to create something that's long lasting, you know, my dream is to be as big as some of the biggest agencies in the world, 20 years time, 30 years, and be, you know, have a longevity. I have to eat, sleep, breathe my business. Everything I do is my business. And, you know, we've created things off the back and I've invested so heavily in making things easier for talent and, you know, how do we scale talent and, you know, almost like the intricates that I've heard from other talent that I've met. It's like they don't have the same and, you know, everyone has a different way of doing it. There's no correct way, but I invest a lot. So I think, you know, I almost risk having a bigger salary. I risk having, you know, my boyfriend not speak to me for three days because, you know, I I can't, I have to just focus but, you know, there's, it's like anything. With every high, there's an equal attracting low. Every low, there's an equal attracting high. So it's just balancing it. But I haven't learned to balance my social life with my business. I will make that very clear. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. How do you? I, mean, I you've, don't. You've got, obviously, uh, you've got family and you've got um, your boyfriend, your amazing dogs. How do you find that? I hate the word balance because I think it implies an equal distribution, which is not is not realistic, right? But my whole theory is if you're present in whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's working in your home, then you, in your soul, you're a lot happier. So how do you manage that? I don't, I'm not sure if my soul's happy. I'm joking. Um, I, I think, like, for me, going out of my friends is, like, a massive thing. My home time is is nice. I actually have... It's, I think it's quite a known thing in my office as well. Like my bath time is like my sacred time. It's the only time I spend, I'm not on my phone. I like to watch The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, zone out like in like extremely hot bath temperature, which is probably unnormal. I literally scold myself. And then I get into bed with my dogs and my boyfriend and that's kind of how I wind down and you know balance. And anything outside of that time is, um, you know, work time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the that. first thing I look at in my morning is my emails. It's very unnatural. <laughs> it's a weird thing, isn't it? Like, it doesn't matter how much I read about serving yourself before you serve others and, like, taking that time in the morning to... Like, I just don't do it. I, I, I do I, try, though. We try. But the I first do... thing I do in the morning is I check my LinkedIn, I check my emails. That's the first thing. Do you I, know, in bed. I think as well, where we read so many books, podcasts, you hear from these, you know, big entrepreneurs, especially the ones that, like, like faces, like Connor Walker, you know, Grace Beverly, Stephen Bartlett, things like that. And you obviously there's like loads more, but I listen to all these different things and then I hear what time they wake up and what time they go to bed. And I'm like, I actually feel guilty because I physically can't get up at six. I don't know why I've tried a million times, but I actually feel hung over at six mm. and I've not even drunk, do you know what I mean? So I get up at 7.30, make my way into work. Then like, I'm always the, like, the last one out of the office anyway. And I'm the last one, I'm more of a night owl, but the self-discipline, I think you almost bo like beat yourself down slightly that your maybe your self-discipline isn't as strong as others, and you wonder if it was, what would change? I don't. It's always like, is that hustle culture, and everyone's talking about it, and you think you have to be part of it. So yeah, I don't go at six, and I feel terrible about it, <laughs> and I don't really go to the gym that often either, and I also feel awful about that too. It's like confession time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've kind of fallen into a similar bracket to you. I don't think there is one size fits all. I think I really, really resent this idea that, you know, you see these lists come up on Instagram and all the social media. It's like, right, if you want to succeed, you get up at five, you go to the gym at six, you have to eat this kind I of know. food, you have to have a plant-based diet, you have to drink 10 gallons of water a day. And it's like, for me, that's not realistic. What works for me is I get up early, I maybe stumble around the house for an hour, have a coffee, make my way in and just get shit done. Like mm. it doesn't work for me to, to conform to such a strict schedule. 
Um, no one better talk to me before my morning coffee. I'm like a zombie. Like Not even my dogs. I'm like, go away. I think that's, that's exactly the same. But I do wish I had more of, you know, that discipline. And, you know, the, the three I mentioned earlier, the people I, ki- I do look up to. And, you know, it's something you strive towards. But at the same time, I do think everyone has their own path. And I, I was, like I said, I was saying to Evie on the way here, I feel like my path wasn't actually that, you know, linear. It, I, f- I went through so many ups and downs and it's take, I've learned lessons that maybe someone who was more experienced wouldn't learn. But I think because I've learned them quite young now, it's helped me instill a team. I didn't know how to grow a team. I didn't know how to train a team. And I didn't know how to put in... Um, you know, like HR practices and it's taken me some time. And I think because I've done it with my team, we're now a closer unit and we work harder for our clients as a result. But for a while, I was actually bashing my head against the computer like, why can't I figure this out? I think you raised a really important point there, which is like hire the skills you don't have. So how have you managed to kind of balance that? This is my baby and this is my business, which I totally relate to, by the way, with hiring people that are better at what you're not great at. I think I've ta- it's, t- it's been hard for me. I, you know, I grew our Instagram. It's now got a 14.8K, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for like a management company, that is a lot. And, you know, all the ideas have always been from me. And now we have a head of marketing and we have, um, you know, a senior talent manager, talent managers, talent assistants, and giving away jobs was a really hard thing. And I became always micromanaging until I realized I was running myself into the ground and realized, you know, you hire someone to do that and you have to trust them. Otherwise, what is the point? You might as well just keep doing it yourself. And like I said, you can trust somebody and you might, you know, I, I've, I've made that mistake. Unfortunately, I've had to let like someone go before. But at the same time is if I didn't trust them, how would I know if they're good at their job? So it's been a slow process, but I'm finally there. And now I'm more than happy to give away some, some work. I'm like, oh, off you go. You know, it's finding a joy with it and finding that trust and know that you've done your job by making sure that your brand values are instilled in your employees. They know exactly, you know, almost how you would work. So your standards mm. and also, you know, especially because obviously to be quite blunt we obviously are a management company we work with numbers every day having the confidence to ask for exactly what we want for our clients and knowing what is the minimum you would accept and finding that middle point too and before I really I would have everyone approve things and now I'm very confident that everyone knows what they're doing if anything they might actually go a bit higher than me and I feel like I'm the weak link these days so you know I've become admin so what aren't (laughs) you good at as it relates to your business um Spreadsheeting has taken me some time. I spent a lot of time with my accountant going through things. It's a different kind of business, you know, in terms of it's a because we take 20%, that is what, you know, you're going, this much money's coming in, this much money's coming out. And then it's like finding your budgets. And it's just because I guess we expanded so quickly. We went from, you know, when I first started, it wasn't a lot of money we we're making. So now, you know, I, I have it's a two man job. And actually, most of the time, it's a three-man job. And it's making sure everything is pristine. Nothing gets through the cracks. You know, we have 38 clients. So, you know, it's making sure the invoices are done. And then they're coming at the right time. Then you're chasing. It's creating all these different systems to make sure at no point is anything ever slipping. And finding the right system as well was really important. And we have tried many different programs. And we're finally at a place where everyone knows exactly what they're doing. We put the booking in. We have everyone's diaries, but before we were using like four different versions to make all those four come together. So it is just like ex- exploring the market maybe. But yeah, I'm not good at um, spreadsheets. Opposite question, what are you great at? What's the, what are you the best at in the business? <laughs> I would like, to, I'm, I have very big dreams and for our clients, I think I'm very good at knowing what they're good at and how I can expand that talent and make make it make I, I'm very good at turning people into brands that's what I'm good at but in a different way to how you do it because you do entrepreneurs I do talent so it was looking at a DJ and saying okay so this is your speciality how do we put you on the radio how do we do this if it's a reality star they've done Love Island how do I keep your career as, as big as it can be for five years how do I make you from a reality star in Love Island to a household name known that is for almost forgotten that you were ever on that show so 
actually, I'm quite good at that side of things. Which and the marketing. Le- which leads me into a really good question, actually, because I'm glad you brought up like the personal branding thing, because obviously we both sit in that bucket, but on, as you said, two completely different areas yeah. of it. How important is personal branding to everyone, do you think? Oh my God, it's so important. I actually, um, so I always look at talent and their personal branding, which, you know, I, I always think is so, so important. It's the biggest part of my job. If they aren't a brand, how do you scale a person? So you're looking at each individual talent as a business almost. And I always, especially the young talent that are coming through, you know, I have a 17 year old um, TikToker who's got like 2 million followers and it's crazy. And it's explaining that, you know, no longer think of yourself as this person who's creating and you're not just a creator. You are a brand within yourself. People look up to you. People want to be like you. And how do you now monetize that and make sure that you're doing what you love, but at the same time, not sacrificing your own brand values, but your brand values are as a people, a person. God, bad grammar. Sorry. Uh, But for myself, I find it very hard to look at my own personal branding. And it's something that I think has taken time my PR was the first person who made me aware that I should be more present and then you gave me a very hard time at the barbecue that I wasn't more present (laughs) um but I I think though that comes from I don't want to detract from my talent so it's finding that in between so not detracting from the talent I'm pushing and you know putting it all onto myself it's a it's a hard balance and I would rather I suffered than my talent it's interesting do you think that stems from like honestly do you think that stems from you not wanting to detract from the talent or maybe like a bit of like fear of visibility it's scary isn't it i i've always been behind the scenes like it's, you don't you couldn't do my job you couldn't be a talent manager you couldn't work for an agency if you wanted to be the center of attention it's just not how it works so it's a it's a different concept so you're taking what you're comfortable with and you're stepping outside your own box essentially but also the moment you're out there I think it's you're accountable for everything and although I've never really been one to shy away and most people know you know what I do and and everything like that it's more when things go wrong people come to you from maybe other industries and go oh why did that happen in the it's like almost like you're talking for the whole industry and it's very not realistic I can't so it is I think I'm just scared (laughs) I think it's interesting actually I think there is a real cost to standing for something because you have to stand for something if you want to stand out right like you can't be just another vanilla entrepreneur like going oh yeah business is great like no one cares about that they care about whatever it is that you stand for and you stand for something very clearly which is pro women like female empowerment all those things we're changing the face of a talent management that is exactly what we want to do we want to change what a management company should be able to do and does do for their talent and you know although we're we're only a little bit through the door with the model side how are we still hearing the same old stories about how model agencies can treat their talent so I I don't want to be a part of that culture at all I want women to bring each other up and rather than tear each other down in an industry that is known for tearing each other down there's a cost to that though, isn't there? There's a cost to you sticking your neck out and standing for something because everyone is looking for perfection. And if you don't have, the, for example, I am very outspoken um, on equal rights and women's rights in particular. I'm very outspoken about what it's like really as growing a startup, like pull the yeah, wall away I, from other You know, side. I actually watch your videos and I always think, wow, it's very brave. I don't speak about the honest truth of starting a startup. I am, I can be, especially with people who don't know what it's like to run a business. I just say like, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard, but I won't get into the nitty gritty. So it's interesting when I see, you know, yourself and you're actually expressing the the full ins and outs, but obviously you see things maybe in a different side. Your experiences will always be different to mine, for example. So it, it's interesting. I like listening to it, but I don't think I quite could discuss every part of why my journey has been hard and I will always say the journey always sounds easier than it actually was so it doesn't matter how nitty and gritty go into it to actually experience it learn those hard lessons and be wrong and make mistakes you know I fuck up all the time and I beat myself down for it but because I'm a perfectionist I managed to turn it around but I do think to admit to that is a very different thing like on a public 
you know, scale, especially because I have talent, I would never want them to think I'm not capable at my job. Mm. And I think actually that's where it stems from. To be honest about running at business is to potentially showcase to talent and clients that you may be, you have made mistakes. Mm. I don't know, it's an interesting thought process perhaps. Regrets, what regrets do you have, if any? Of, uh, in your business. I don't have any to be fair I wouldn't I wouldn't be good at what I do if I did have regrets you know I could laugh about having regrets um but if I didn't have this journey I don't think I'd be where I am now the company wouldn't perhaps have shot up as quickly as it did and you know I couldn't have paid half the talent I had a year ago to be signed with us so that I think that really just shows that every mistake and regret I may have thought I had led us to this point and you know, like I had. I'll tell. This is actually a fun story, but embarrassing slightly. And um, my team will kill me for actually saying this. But for Anna and Mandy, when they joined us, I was so nervous. I got absolutely smashed, and I got so drunk. I did a whap in a car, like in our cab, right? So you know the whap dance. <laughs> and I apparently I did the whap and like fell over. But I thought Mandy pushed me. I was like, Mandy, you pushed me. And they were saying like. But I regretted that. Like the next day I woke up with a fear. I thought, oh my God, like I've worked so hard to try and make this the most perfect dinner. And, but they were like, because you were that way, I knew that you were the perfect manager for me. So it doesn't matter. People love you for you and they trust you and your visions. I will know I've never been that drunk again. <laughs> I think I think it's so true though. Like this idea that, I think a lot of people believe that a personal brand is this big shiny glittery object that's like disconnected to who you are as an individual. But the way I see it is it's just who you are, but at scale. So it's things like that that are endearing. It's things like that that are like, yes, I want her to manage me. It's things like that that will make people want to sign with you and not with someone else. And that ultimately is what the personal part of your brand is, I think. I don't, also, I don't know if you feel something similar, but my brand has ex um, you know, developed as I've got older. And it makes me wonder what my brand will be like as I get older. So I started at 24. My logo was bright pink. Like, honestly, the most horrific thing you've ever seen in your whole life. Like, awful. And then now it's, you know, a nude. And, now, and also, what you said was quite interesting of you are basically your brand. You know, it's a reflection. And I always keep going to everyone as a joke. Oh, maybe we should turn my logo into orange with like a white front. Because my hair, I think, has become quite synonymous with me. Like, everyone knows, you know, my hair probably before me. And, um, you know, and I do wonder as, as I grow, will, will my brand change from the fact that I am quite young, we are like hungry. And that's one of the reasons people do love us is because I can relate. And I think it is a fear of, as I get older, I'm now gonna have to get someone to almost replace maybe me as a public figure of the brand because people want that young. I, it's interesting I'm always thinking all the time like in the next 10 years what is the brand going to be like what is the management going to be like who's going to be the face because if I'm 40 well that's not in 10 years by the way um you know how how would that still work I would like to think I'm going to be like the rich auntie vibe but who knows <laughs> you you mentioned earlier that entrepreneurs and you particularly just have all these ideas and like some of them are completely undoable so how do you manage picking the good ones and sacking off the ones that aren't so good? I usually call um, my head of creative and branding James and I just like put these all out and he will go, no. Uh, he'll, he'll pick out bits or we'll take ideas. Usually it's a combination of 10 ideas that creates the one final thing that we do. So like, cause we don't have a product, it'll be more a case of, okay, so how are we gonna do that person's show reel? How, so our videos, I think is something that become really like, something that people can recognize us. You know, we have very high production standards. And though, so the video we posted yesterday is gone out as a, you know, a sponsored ad. Um, but it took, I think 15 days to plan that video and to pull content and, find the right and the music wasn't right it was very aggressive and the colors weren't right and it didn't feel right and although you have your brand pack and everything it has to still relate to people have to know straight away that is you, you even if you have a product or not you are a brand so I guess that's why I think I'm going to keep my hair forever orange and white 
Where do you start with branding though? Like I think people are, people as a, are a product, right? You're selling a product, which is people. I'm selling a product, which is people. Our clients are our product. Your clients are your products. Where do you even start with that? Where do you even start with branding an individual rather than a product or a service? I think what's key with branding is, you know, I so I would always say to research all your competitors and look at the things that you love what they're doing and then the things that you would change. And, you know, within that, you can kind of find what you love and how you would you would change it. So I made it very clear from the beginning. So I've had four logos. <laughs> um, the last one was one I had hand drawn and it took six weeks to finalize the big HLD that we have. And so now, you know, I would never change my logo. That is it's original. It's so different to what everyone else has. It's not it's, I actually have so noticed that all branding tends to look the same these days. It looks like that Balenciaga, that big block writing. And I wanted something that really you could see it and go, I know exactly what that is. And, you know, I tried different color schemes. I felt inspired by different Instagram pages. And I've gone through so many different brandings. And I am I can almost ensure, like, I, I know that my branding will change again. As I get older, as my vision changes, as the, like my pathway will always stay the same. The end goal will always stay the same. But to get to that end goal, if I change within that, I'm not scared to change it as I develop and as our you know company develops and especially our talent. So it has, the pink vibe felt great when I was 24. I'm 20, I just turned 27 and you know, now it's nude. But I also think the reason that that nude color has become our branding is because it's on trend. And I think that's also important for a young company is you stay on trend regardless. If the logo has never changed, the brand, the way it looks has never changed, just the color scheme has. So what's the future hold for Hannah Holland and HLD? Mm, that would be telling. No, I um. I really, really, really hope that HLD expands to exactly how I want it to be. I, I know it will be. My work ethic is pretty intense, but I HLD LA has been the goal for a really long time. Being a global management company is has been always the goal. Being able to take a talent and get us exactly there, like having those contacts because we've built them all. Every contact we've had, we have hustled to get there. So have just having it all in one piece, I guess, and always expanding. I just want to take over the world. And but and the, I also actually really want a dogs charity. Strange, I know, but I want to help all the dogs because I'm obsessed. I love that. Like a pink fluffy dog palace. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Lisa a little Vanderpump bit off. Pump style. Yeah, like a little bit off brand of what we've spoken about. But that, you know, helping as many people along the way has always been the goal. And, you know, there's no point doing anything unless you can help someone along that way with you. And whether that's your team, whether that's your clients, whether that's, you know, young girls who want to be like you and you grow up or something along those lines. If you're not helping people, I don't see the point. Yeah, I love that. It's to put the ladder back down after you. Hannah, you are building one of the most, if not the most disruptive talent management companies in the UK and hopefully the globe. Thank you. You are you. well on your way to <laughs> Forbes 30 under 30. Do you know what? That is on my vision board. <laughs> Forbes, if you're listening, I'm ready. We're putting it out there. <laughs> Hannah's going to be on the Forbes 30 under 30. You are running, as I said, the most disruptive talent, to, I believe one of the most disruptive talent management agencies in the UK. Thank if you, you could go back, final question, if mm. you could go back and tell your 21-year-old self three things, what would they be? Believe in yourself. Your weight isn't the most important thing. And it doesn't matter what anyone tells you, as long as you're a good person and you have good beliefs, morals, and guidance around you, you will always do well. I love that, Hannah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.